Welcome to the Pass to Understanding podcast. Today we'll be sharing wisdom from our neighborhood with Chris Hoke from Underground Ministries. Our mission at Pass to Understanding is to bridge bias and build unity through multi-faith peacemaking. As we begin, I want to acknowledge that I am standing or sitting today on the traditional land of Coast Salish peoples, specifically the Samish and the Swinomish. We honor with gratitude the land itself, the people who lived upon and cared for it since time immemorial, and we commit to working for a better, more just world together. Today, we're so happy to have with us Chris Hoke, who is the founding director of Underground Ministry and the creator of One Parish, One Prisoner program in Washington State, equipping churches to practice resurrection alongside men and women as they release from prison tombs. With a bachelor's from UC Berkeley, an MFA in creative nonfiction from Seattle Pacific University, and 17 years learning about Jesus' mission alongside gang-affected men in Skagit Valley, Chris is now a commissioned Presbyterian USA pastor, the author of Wanted, and is thrilled to still be rooted with his family in the beautiful Skagit Valley with his wife, Rachel, and two boys, Abram and Robin. You can learn more about them at undergroundministries.org. So Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. It's awesome to be here, Terry. So Chris, please describe the work of Underground Ministries and, and the work of the One Prisoner, One Parish program. Great. Um, so as, as that little bio had, had mentioned, um, I've been working alongside gang affected uh, men that I met inside the Skagit County Jail. I came up here 17 years ago after graduating from, from Berkeley wanting to um, live out what I thought was beautiful and radical in the Gospels, but I was done with church already at like age 22, but I, I wanted to live out the Jesus stuff, which still seemed to be both mystically beautiful and socially um, rad. Um, and so I came up here to the Northwest to work with a guy named Bob Eckblad, who was uh, kind of like a living uh, liberation theologian. I was, I was really, um, I was following from California and he was working with undocumented migrant farm workers here in the Skagit Valley and turning a jail into like a seminary and doing kind of like um, dialogical Bible studies, the way Central American liberation theologians were uh, in the mountains. He had started Honduras and he was doing that now in a jail. And I thought, perfect. I want to, I want felons to meet my seminary students with me. Um, cause that sounds like the context in which the new Testament was written anyway. Um, so when I came up here, I thought it'd be for like a couple of years and I'd go do, you know, graduate studies or something, but I was young and lonely and coming out of my own kind of crippling depression during my time in college. And so entering a lockdown facility at night after the Bible studies, so many of these guys, a lot of them, my age, early twenties, ink on their faces, their hands, their necks that said awesome stuff. Like they could exegete the streets of like, here's the tax collectors, here's the prostitutes, here's the den of thieves, that's where the Pharisees are. Like, they could help me make connections so quickly. But they're also funny. And then they started calling me their pastor. And I was like, yeah, that was still a bad word for me. Um, but they asked me to do pastor visits. I'm like, okay, like, if that helps us do a one on one visit, but I'd stay till like 930, 10 p.m. every night. And then the jail guards would kick me out after we do these one on ones. So all to say, gang members kind of ordained me from below, so to say, and invited me out into the underside of this valley. On the surface, it's farmland, tulips, salmon rivers, suburbs. Um, but underneath, there's, there's a pretty active life of addiction and pain and crime, domestic violence, meth dealing, gang banging. Um, so working with gang members, that comes like the first several years is um, being like a pastor or like a shepherd of like the unwanted folks of the community. A lot of them didn't get released from jail. They were sentenced and shipped off to distant human landfills or prisons. So I learned how to write letters and stay in touch with many of these guys. And when they got released, I didn't hear from them. And I'd see them in jail again. And I started to learn there's a huge gulf when guys get out of prison, they're not really home. They didn't have how, they had these beautiful dreams and visions in their letters, they would write to me, but they didn't materialize when they stepped out of the prison gate. I and I came to see that they were still underneath and like in a civic netherworld. You come home and you go, you can't get good housing. You can't get good jobs. You can't get good 
uh, you can't get your driver's license. We could talk all day about how hard it is to get your driver's license and, and financial debt that stacks up at compounding interest. And so I started to work with a few individuals on planning their reentry a year ahead of time. Yeah. And we say reentry, but it's really entering the land of the living that they've never had um, to kind of have a good job, have legitimate housing. Um, and so as I figured out how to break someone, not just out of prison, but out of the underworld, out of the underground, um, reentry kind of came, became my focus. That's where I saw there was transformation, not just chasing gang members around, but on reentry. Then as I wrote a book about some of this, and when I was speaking in a lot of different churches and one Episcopalian church, um, during the Q and a session, people always say, well, what can we do other than, you know, Sunday morning entertainment? Oh, there's some cool mission going on there without gang members. How is anyone going to participate with that? What can we do? And someone told me that in Washington state, there's roughly the same amount of churches as there are incarcerated men and women. Wow. And that, that kind of stuck in my head for a while. And someone said, we could do a one parish, one prisoner. It was just one lady out of St. Paul's Episcopal. And that stuck in my head as we went through conferences where Brian Stevenson was speaking at seminaries in Nashville and in North Carolina. And that vision just grew. So we started underground ministries about five years ago as a new platform to do one parish, one prisoner. How do we train churches everywhere to be in relationship with one person, not to start a whole program, but just be in relationship with one person and to do re effective reentry work, coming around one person and rolling away all those reentry barriers, maybe like rolling away the stones in both of Jesus' resurrection and in Lazarus's. So the kind of a resurrection imagery helped us imagine resurrection in reentry communities. And now we have um, 31 active uh, one person prisoner churches in Washington, and we feel like we're just getting started. So, you know, Chris, I, I want to hear more about like the the kind of the scale of mass incarceration and and its impact on people and communities. But I I'm 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 struck by a similarity between you know what you and I do in a sense, and that I spend a lot of my time trying to prepare Christian communities for relationship with other people of other traditions. Mm -hmm. And and there are certain uh, certain things that are that are common, like between between congregations, even the well intentioned ones. Mm -hmm. And so, what are some of the things you've you've been surprised about, or that you've learned about how to prepare congregations for a relationship with someone that is is newly free and trying to be in the world, and how they can support that person? We're learning a lot. Um, I think what, what helps is when we, like our mission statement at Underground Ministries is Underground Ministries opens new relationships. Right. That's our key verb. It's not assist the incarcerated. It's not yep. reduces recidivism. Right. We open new relationships of embrace and trust between the incarcerated and the communities to which they return for our mutual transformation and resurrection. Yeah. And so I think just starting the conversation there, that this is, this is a mutual this is a journey of mutual transformation and change. Um, I think people want that, um, but I've found that it, it's a whole different conversation if you start there, because there's just a lot of old scripts we go off of. Um, you know, conservative yeah. conservative Christian religion would be about like you know saving souls or evangelizing, but the but the, the liberal default is is very similar. There's still a white savior kind of sense of like, oh, I've seen all the documentaries, I've got all this white guilt, and we just need to help. We just need to help, and you see hear the H word all the time, like. Conservatives, you know, it's H-E-L-L. -L. You hear that word a lot. And in, in, in uh, liberals, it's H-E-L-P, which is better than H-E-L-L. -L, but it's still, it's not quite there yet. Um, and so when, 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 when you invite people into a mutual journey, uh, as we do in One Parish, One Prisoner, I find that people are relaxed. One, that the performance anxiety is off. They're like, great, I don't have to right. pretend right. that we are, we're taught in white supremacy that like, what, what goes with supremacy goes with, I need to have all the answers. So we all feel like we're faking it because we don't have the answers to say, Hey, you don't have to have all the answers and right. your kind of itching spiritual hunger might be satisfied through this. You don't have to go perform. This might be what you're needing as well. That helps. So it takes the pressure off from helping or changing the other and it opens up people's hunger rather than they're just their anxious activism. I think that helps. Um, and, and then once you put people together, then magic happens. So much of one person, one prisoner is just trying to 
engineer a logistical bridge so that human beings can enter into what Brian Stevenson calls that power of proximity. That when you, I finally get the homeschooled mom at the Lutheran church writing letters and having calls with the Mexican former gang member in solitary confinement, and he's having a breakdown coming off his meds, and she can say, well, I have a long chapter in my life of mental health struggle that no one else knows about, but you're a safe guy. And there's a new, I, I, all these surprises happen. Like the guy in solitary confinement actually is more safe than anyone in the church because I can tell you anything. You're not going to judge me. And they start talking about their shared mental health journeys of meds and shame. And that they start having Sunday afternoon calls. They call, call each other mental health buddies and laughing about the weird things their brain did to them that week. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, that's, there's, there's always this, what Father Greg Boyle calls just kinship so quickly that if you can just get one, frame it in mutuality, and then two, put people in proximity to each other where they're in relationship, this, a generative human contact happens and it takes over more than any book. Right. So I'm, I'm thinking, I'm mindful of a couple of things. You know, first of all, um, what did, why did Jesus probably get in enough trouble, you know, to get on the radar to be killed? Well, it was because he was willing to break through the status keeping expectations of the day and have table fellowship and be in proximity to a whole lot of folk that people weren't supposed to be in proximity to each other because yeah. it was all built like a pyramid instead of like a circle. Right. Mm -hmm. And then and, and and then number two, I like I always talk with with congregations about how we, we have we need to have a di different understanding of power and imagination around it. Mm -hmm. And so many of us were raised in an idea of power, that power is power over other people. And, uh, and, then, and then some progressive -y folk, you know, more liberalish folks, sometimes think we got to have power for other people, which is maybe okay, like once in a while, in a very short period of time, like transitionally, like maybe in a certain situation, like maybe that's okay. But it needs to transition very quickly to power with others. And it's been really interesting to like watch that. people process that. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Jesus had power with people. And when folk tried to get power over him, he'd kind of push back. When people try to lift him up and sort of make him in more powerful than them, he would, he would resist that. Yeah. He was always striving for that kind of mutuality. Mm -hmm. And I think about the, 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 what, what is in the Christian scriptures in, interpreted as the kingdom of God. Well, I think about it as, as God's way of mutuality. <laughs> That's another way to say the kinship of God, which, you know, which is also another way to reframe that. Yeah. I mean, I hear in my voice, I mean, maybe because I was raised with this um, <laughs> my sandwich system and church upbringing, there's always like a interested, but cynical conservative pushback voice in my head that I'm, I'm always, I'm always kind of talking to. Um, and it was just like, well, that sounds nice. That just sounds like a rebranding the whole New Testament with progressive pop lingo. And I would say no to that voice. And I would want to sub totally back what you're saying with like just summarize the entire book of Acts. Like when it breaks out of just Jesus led ministry and whatever this kingdom or world that Jesus is foretelling starts to kind of like ripple out into actual re relationships it's like that breaks out of the parables into actual actions that the Holy Spirit is leading. The Holy Spirit is just like a long five series and mini series of mutuality, right? Like every single, like whether it's Saul, you know, the, the feared aggressor being transformed, but it's in relationship with Ananias and the fearful community saying we're afraid of him to embracing him, to calling him brother, to taking him home and smuggling him out. Like who, ch who changed who? Right. Or, or Paul or Peter going into Cornelius's home. Right. And the Holy Spirit comes, but Peter had this vision that completely changed his entire biblical paradigm about who's in and who's out, like who changed who. So it's, I, I like that, that it's a, it's, a, it's a social movement of mutuality that really upends power structures, who's in, who's out. Um, but it, it doesn't, it's not mandated. That's what I like about the Holy Spirit is it's, is it's not enforced from above even by a progressive government, right? It's like this mystical flourishing that 
drops people on their asses and opens their hearts and propels them forward rather than just like, well, I guess we got to love those bleep bleep bleeps because I'll get fined if I don't. Well, you know, and, and part of that, you know, while we're kind of thinking about the, the Christian tradition, you know, which is perfectly appropriate since, you know, both of us, you know, are Christians, right, is, um, is the, you know, we, we forgive others as God forgives, the, you, know, we, God, you know, God forgives us, we forgive those who sin, trespass against us or sin against us, right? There's any time I, I dehumanize another, don't recognize their humanity, I, anytime we as a group draw a circle around ourselves and say, well, inside this circle, we're really human, and those outside that circle aren't, well, there's going to be a part of me that is outside that circle too, right? And so when I, when I forget to recognize the humanity in other people, I lose touch. I don't lose my humanity, but I lose touch with some of my humanity, I think. And yeah. And so it's it's so that that journey of healing and relationship with another is is really a connected to and part of our relationship with ourselves and our and our internal healing. A absolutely, like I that's something that I, I want to develop a lot more. Um, it's in a few of our learning modules in the one parish one prisoner journey. But I mean, I don't want to conflate interfaith dialogue yet with like in. Uh, in uh, incarcerated, non-incarcerated relationships. Oh, I'm sure, going sure. to try to stay in that schema right. for a little bit. And then That's I want to practice with you how that flips horizontally. Sure, sure. Um, but, and I say vertically right now, not because I really believe there's people who are less than, but that is the way that it's set up. I understand. And that for me, I'm really interested in prison as macro metaphor for what we do internally. And that repress is the keyword. Right. Um, and that, um, like when I went to old Folsom prison and learned contemplative prayer inside there with this group, um, uh, prison contemplative fellowship, um, I, I came outside like the old stony fortress, like you see on the, you know, Johnny Cash recordings and movie and, and it's its own postal code and the postal code that Folsom prison, California, it's not in Folsom, California, its own postal code is Repressa, California. And from and, and it was in there that I mean, so much of contemplative prayer is about sinking down in silence into the repressed places. I mean, it's really trauma informed practitioners I went with, but I was like, oh my god, like the prison is the nat national subconscious. Wow, the prison is if a society had a subconscious where we repress everything we can't tolerate, but we can't hold, but we want to, you know, psychologists say that we need to cut off. Um, into the into the unconscious of our our, our addictions, uh, our racism, our uh, our violence, our 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 our, our sexual woundedness and, and, and brokenness, um, and so we repress it, and it because that's also what we do inside of ourselves. And so I'm really interested in as p churches, particularly, learn to welcome someone coming out of the national subconscious. Right. It's activating parts of their own, how they've repressed themselves. Mm -hmm. Right. Like we, yeah, it, there's this one module we have called writing my wrongs where, where this one team wanted to, we, they realize at some point, whether it's writing a letter to a judge on their behalf or an employer or other parishioners, they need to know the person's story about their crime. But one team was like, we'd feel it like it's too one way. Just you, us asking you to kind of describe at length some of the worst stuff you've ever done. Can we write to you some of the things that we're not really proud of and they're kind of stuff in our closet. And right. it was, it was really liberating. And a lot of folks felt like, man, this feels really good. And most people said, and it feels like this is the safest person in the world. And so I'm really interested in how churches right. can be unrepressing that they mirror, mirror what we do out there is what we do in here that if we're welcoming what's coming up in here, we might be able to welcome people who have repressed out there or right. vice versa, that as we welcome people home from prison, oh, I can talk about this skeleton in my closet. Um, and so that way, that, that's on a theoretical or on a more deeper level, that's how I see mutuality actually happening is that it, it is unlocking the repressed in, inside of us as we do that in community relationships. You know, Chris, and I, I did a funeral, you know, many years ago, I've done, you know, of course, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of funerals. But mm -hmm. but there was this one situation in particular, where, you know, a man had a, had some pretty tough stuff in his past. And, and basically, you know, he died because he had an addiction. 
Mm -hmm. right that that taxed his body and and he died fairly early in life you know um and his family was convinced that if i spoke a word about any of that at the funeral that that would be the worst thing in the world mm -hmm. and yeah. i told them i said no um if we do not speak about that briefly at least acknowledge it we don't have to go into every detail or anything but if we don't acknowledge that that happened what we're saying is is that is at the end of the service when we we do a blessing for that person that god blesses everything except the unspoken part mm -hmm. and i said i believe god's god's love and compassion that god's that god's willingness to bless and welcome this person includes what um what was difficult for him and difficult for all of you yeah and uh and 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 boy they were mad <laughs> they were so mad at me uh, uh until this funeral happened and i i said it in like two sentences and then we spoke the blessing and afterward like you could see them just releasing all this sense of rejection and from from god upon themselves for not being able to help him mm -hmm. and upon him for for not being able to overcome this and part of what i said in the sermon is that you know as a little kid when my mom got ms like i learned something really profound that a lot of the other kids didn't know and that is that human beings were breakable mm -hmm. we can be overcome mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and but i but part of the reason why i hang with the christian church even though it's painful and difficult sometimes is because of the story that god like became a, a vulnerable, limited human being, right? Oh, yeah. And so therefore blesses that process, blesses ours. Like I think that's what that's why I, I I stick with it, even though the church so often doesn't like trust that enough to like let ourselves do it. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean it the story for me is just infinitely compelling about not only a God who would transgress the most ancient of barriers, you know, right. the divine and the human right. and, be and become vulnerable right. and then enter into our bad religion. I mean, that's what I like so much about the, the both the Hebrew and the Christian scriptures is that, uh, that it, it, it's, it, it, it's not just like, well, there's this ideal and we've fallen short from it, but it actually reflects back and engages and prophetically diagnoses our bullshit in our bad religion, right? It's a, it's a, it's like a slow mo parody and exposure of our bad religion, rather than just the, some transcendent ideal above it of God, like entering into our violence and our fear and our insanity and our bad religion and the way the temple will always work together with the empire and together use violence to crush and repress and reject. And he's like, okay, right. watch. I'm gonna do. Watch me watches it represses and crushes and rejects me and how I do not participate that but I'm not afraid of it either right you now I'm greater than that and I'm going to teach you all how to love one another yeah um, yeah I even right maybe the right there that helped me even connect when I was saying earlier like let's talk with you know incarcerated non-incarcerated relationships first if that's repression I'm gonna use my hands like this then rejection is just this right so it's still you're either pushing it down or you're pushing it away right and maybe like in the book of Acts, like a pushing down is like kill, put in the tombs. So right. for me, mass incarceration is just the legal version of crucifixion and putting mm -hmm. in the tombs. That's right. And res practicing resurrection is bringing out of the tombs what we've tried to repress. But then the resurrection narratives lead into the book of Acts where it goes out, right? It's, it's no longer just among the tombs, but to all the people that they've said we need to reject. The, the violent folks, Saul, the... Uh, uh, the pagans or the people that we've said our cleanliness and purity code says we can't touch, go into that home. We can't touch that food. All that's off. Um, that's, that's exciting to me. And I, I, let's dive into how this applies to in, in, interfaith. Um, yeah. Project. So, so, so just a couple things there that I, that are, that are coming up for me. I mean, first of all, uh, crucifixion was legal, right? Cause <laughs> yeah, the, totally. the Romans, you know, decided that it's always legal. They, still legal. Would, yeah, absolutely. That they would they would kill between you know fifteen and twenty thousand a year, I guess, is what some scholars think. Like it was a lot of people every year. They were exceedingly good at it, yeah. right? 
And then what they would do is, is you know, in, like in Jesus case, they, they put up a sign said, this person's a thief, this person's a, this terrible thing. And, and there's a part of human beings that's kind of vulnerable with our just world, you know, sort of bias, we tend to think, well, you know, things aren't so bad. And, and if people work hard, you know, they can, they can pull themselves up by whatever bootstraps they have, you know, even if they don't have boots, boots or straps, right. And, uh, and so it, it must be their fault. And of course, part of that thing in the Roman Empire was to blame the family, to to bring shame on the family, mm -hmm. you know. And and so you know, when Jesus says, "Take up your cross," well, he's not talking about take up a religious symbol and stick it on your stick it on your your around your neck or something. Mm -hmm. What he's saying is is I, I think what he means is two things. Number one is is to take up the consciousness of your vulnerability and mortality. Right. That's that's part of it. And and to deal with that every day spiritually so that when a moment of threat comes, you're not completely maybe overwhelmed. You know, number two is is to take up like uh, revolutionary love, it, which is going to threaten knowingly, which is going to threaten the empire. You know, so he's saying be about like living out this revolutionary love like all the time and know that, that the empire is going to see it as a threat and they may, in fact, kill you. Right. But then the Christian story is that Jesus does that. And then he's raised from the dead in a way of saying, hey, even when the empire is functioning that way. Right. Even when it does kill you, it, it does not have the last word. Because it did not speak the first word, which is let there be. Right. And so I, I and then thinking about the, the, the multi faith. So I, now I'm going to talk about the the whole purity code thing for a minute, because. I think um, the Jewish people like had purity codes for a very important reason, which especially around Jesus time, which was that they'd been under repression of various sorts for like 300 years by the time Jesus is born. And so part of what they were trying to do is to remain a strong community, remembering the story of their freedom from Egypt and their, their liberation from Babylon. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, and so I, I think there are times when our conversation about how the about the purity codes can actually not be helpful in a kind right. of a multi faith way, because you know, um, because we can often say, well, there was this bad religion, and that bad religion was Judaism. And I know that you're not saying that, right? But sometimes no. people people hear that, and sure, so sure. like my my goal uh, when I go to work with churches isn't to is is really just one thing. I want them to be more authentically uh, Christian and to follow Jesus in a more authentic way. Yes. And and so and then what is the core of that? Well, the core of that in the Abrahamic tradition is to uh, that God wants to create a community whose primary value is to be a blessing to all the other communities. Yes. And then and then we human beings tip you know do this in group thing where yeah you're you're um if you're if you're different from us you're not really fully human right which really uh, under undermines the entire routine <laughs> which right, really right. undermines the entire the the entire hope of the abrahamic tradition yes and what i respect about our jewish neighbors is that they were willing to in their scripture have critiques of themselves mm -hmm. to have different voices right and and sometimes even to share stories that, that obviously they weren't proud of as warnings about how not to behave. Like, so it's really interesting and in engaging in multi-faith work, how, um, how what I, what I want to encourage people to do isn't to not take Jesus seriously. It's to take him more seriously mm -hmm. and then begin to, um, to recognize that, Hey, those Samaritans, um, you know, those Samaritans uh, have the humanity to, to help, help a Jewish person alongside the road. Yeah, um, I, I, I think when I when I when I think you you bring up a really important point to 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 consider that I think about for within kind of like I guess the Christian community holding and what they call the Bible, both the Hebrew scriptures and the the early Christian scriptures. Um, but I forget like when I was when I was at Berkeley, I was writing my undergrad a lot about the Gospels. I had some some professors I worked with push back 
about how it how some of the things I would I was saying could be seen as or historically has been weaponized in an anti-Semitic way. Sure. And and my my thesis had already been turned in, but I wanted to come back and say, oh, good point. What I would want to say is, yeah, the way I read the the epic of the Hebrew scriptures into kind of from what I see as like the flowering of Jesus's ministry and work and movement is that this is archetypal of all religions. Right. Um, this isn't like this is a Christian revelation over and against Judaism. For me, that's just a really weird, right. you know, where it began and even to the Gospel of John, right? Like the kind of like Hellenists that were anti-Semitic. It's really unfortunate. And I think it misses the whole point yeah. of, of even reading the Hebrew scriptures. I take the Hebrew people as like the just human beings par excellence and yeah. everything, both from the oppression to the making their own. Right. Wanting a kingdom and wanting a king and wanting a military and wanting to build the temple. It's like this perfect extended myth of like how all people, how all religions operate and how all politics and pettinesses work. And so for me, the, the flowering for me of the Jesus movement is first off, uh, I read it as a completely in line with the promises and the hopes that we see from in the beginning of the Hebrew scriptures and right. Politics were different 2000 years ago. It probably would have still been seen as like a radical, most progressive sect of the Jew Jewish religion. It wouldn't have been, wouldn't have been a different religion. Right. Um, it, it's so, and then, so then now back to purity codes too. Yeah. I, I think even those purity codes in the, in the desert, like all religions, like all human organizing, I think we have, we put up healthy boundaries for certain reasons in certain contexts. Right. And the religion, religious impulse makes them sacred and tries to make them permanent. Mm -hmm. like so much Leviticus, I almost see as just like public health 101 for when you're living homeless and nomadic in the desert. And, right. You know, put, put your sperm over here, wash your pots over there, <laughs> put the blood over there, put the babies right. over there. Um, <laughs> you know, wash your hands over there because yeah. people get sick. Right. And so I think there was a very pragmatic cleanliness. Right. Um, going on about how to survive, almost like when you go camping with your family, you know, like wash your hands over there, go poop over right. there. Right. Otherwise, it's going to be a mess real quick. Right. right. And but I think that even quickly could become so enshrined in their sense of order and identity <laughs> um, that, yeah, I don't think all, all to say, I wonder how many codes in every society, in every religion had a very organic and natural, maybe disposable history. Um, but they became something we need to outgrow. So I, I think I, I, you know, I think our our I think this is a conversation that would be good to have with a rabbi because I I've, I've heard some rabbis talk about this before in in ways that that I I can't really represent you know sure. well enough because there's a there's a whole spirituality about it. It's not it's about it too. And I and I remember as a kid, you know, my my mom uh, I I ate a I ate a, a locust or a grasshopper and it tasted pretty good and my mom switched it out of my mouth and said that was yucky, right? There's a purity code right there too, right? Yep. Um but I I I think I think part of the point is this that 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 wisdom traditions can very easily be used to support the idea to support unjust systems. Mhm. Mm and and basically, I think you know part of the 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 core of what we're trying to get at here is that the creator of the universe does not consent to bless unjust systems. I mean, I think that 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 that's and and works to like disentangle us from them and helps to transform them. Like I think that's part of what what we have going on here. So so Chris, you know, the, theologically, like, um, how do you think like Christian theology? plays a role in like this mass incarceration that we see in this in this country like how how does our you know some some traditions imagination about that contribute to this sort of if you if you do the crime you got to do the time and and then even after you do the time you know we're not going to welcome you back as a worker in the community where you're not going to get housing you're not going to get a dri driver's license and all those things like how do you sort of think about that well, something I do think a lot about. Um, it, 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 it's, it's a constant struggle for me when we talk Christian. Are we talking about the heart of the faith I feel like I'm trying right. to live out? Are we talking about its roots? Are we talking about its history? Are we talking about scriptures? 
Sure. Or are we talking about 2,000 years later through three different European or Northern, Northern Hemisphere empires and how they've wielded and weaponized the religion that we call Christianity? Right. Some of my fr friends and of other faiths have said, hey, you can't just disavow that. You, you got you to gotta own it, Chris. That's, that's part of it. So I can't just be like, oh, that's not Christianity. I don't believe it is, but I do have to, I can't just, in my idealism, step over it. Right. So one major Christianity, if there's multiple, um, is Northern European, um, kind of became crystallized in the writings of John Calvin after they broke the Catholic Church. Um, and in John Calvin's Christianity, which is largely American Christianity, because uh, everything that came over in the birth of uh, white colonizers brought over largely Northern European um, kind of Reformation era teachings, right. um, is a God which for me is an antichrist God. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to my, I mean, I'm probably going to be what I'm saying to be liked more by my, my Jewish or uh, Muslim or Buddhist brothers and sisters than my Reformed Christian brothers and sisters, because for me, Reformed Christianity is Antichrist. Um, and I've spent time in John Calvin's writings, like the God he's describing is the antithesis of the Father that Jesus describes. Uh, he, the first thing on page one, section one of the Institutes is like completely consistent with what I heard growing up as an evangelical kid, all powerful, all controlling is what they mean. And if you if you've grew up in evangelicalism, like I did, you've heard the word sovereign and sovereign is like the controlling um, omnipotent puppeteer of the whole world. Um, and so for me, that is the, the dream of a warden, like prisons uh, and, and wardens mirror and manifest Calvin's world, which is there's like a, a sovereign, all controlling um, all-knowing uh, warden of the, of, the, of the cosmos. And yeah. nothing happens outside the control of this narcissist at the top who demands obedience, who demands um, worship. Like, who demands worship? Um, and then punishes horribly, painfully, torturously those who do not bend the knee. Yeah. And even enforces and rewards the loyal by letting them look at the ongoing torment and torture of those who don't obey. I mean, that's, that's the fantasy of a narcissist warden king, right? And right. so in Northern Europe, John Calvin breaking from the Catholic church, I mean, it was super corrupt, but one of the sad things is that John Calvin didn't cycle back to like the early church, but started to just write a whole new religion in the image of a Northern European uh, socio-political um, king. So this is how this imagination of God, that there is an all controlling one on top that is totally fine with thousands being um, destroyed, um, yeah. tormented, punished for the sake of that will and ego and persona of the person at the top. Um, and that would be called the kingdom for me, that's just one of the most toxic religions in the history <laughs> of the religions that I know of. And it gets called Christianity, which is one of the greatest tragedies and travesties of the West. And so for me, you and I were talking about this before we hit record, the line between Calvin's God and religion and the colonies and manifest destiny and slavery and mass incarceration, for me, it's just a really clear line. Um, and so if we're talking about mass incarceration, it makes sense that the most Calvinist imagination nation on the world also has the most runaway mass incarceration problem. And before that, we had, you know, a, a third of our population be people, people living in, in living hell um, that were not human and that that's okay. Um, right. So yeah, that's the, that for me, that's the religious root of it that we need to confront. And I think Christians maybe I would say like me, who don't like that Calvinist Christianity, it's up to us to call it out and to help heal it from the inside. And so maybe five or six years ago, I would have just been like middle finger at the church. I'm going to go do the stuff that I like. Doing one parish one prisoner has actually helped me cycle back with a lot of churches, many of them that have reformed traditions. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't 
show them all my cards like I did with you right now and the good yeah. folks listening to Past to Understanding podcast. Right. Um, but I found that a lot of the men and women inside these churches, I feel the same compassion for them as I do for the men and women in prisons. Right. Is that this, they were just raised in this and, and that they're suffering um, and that they can be welcomed out of kind of a death dealing structure together with the incarcerated, that we need each other. So that's, that's what I feel that the, the curve I'm learning on right now. Yeah, I mean, it's been it's been a real struggle, you know, for, for me, too. I mean, I grew up in a Lutheran church. Um, I've been a pastor now for 31 years, you know, Chris. And um, but around like 1998, you know, I, I kept going to tech studies with Lutheran pastors and hearing the same thing every week and and realized that there was lots of the Christian scripture they weren't paying attention to. And and uh, so I began to do a lot more reading and and realized that, you know, Jesus was a, you know, a nonviolent revolutionary, you know, he wasn't trying to, trying to, uh, hello there, he wasn't trying to, um, you know, start a new religion, right? Um, he was trying to address, uh, you know, the, the really deep challenges of occupation by the Roman Empire, and how he and folk were, were being captivated by that. And um, I think, you know, uh, the, the way I hear a lot of Christians talk about God, it's like, yeah, God is, has set up kind of this prison universe, and the earth is kind of like a, um, uh, is kind of like being on probation, mm -hmm. right? And if you, if you do the right things, you get out of probation and go to heaven, and if you believe or do the wrong things, you, you go to hell forever, and I've just never understood that, like, how can heaven be heaven? If I know the whole time I'm singing that the creator that that there's people being tormented for forever, and of course, what all that's about isn't about heaven or hell. It's about how we set up our society today, because how we talk about God is often the way we structure our society, yep. and the way we you know. And so, um, I, I just think I think back to to situations in in history where people have used uh, God language to support. Uh, again, those historically unjust societies, and uh, and even the enslavement of people, which of course happened in this country, it was theologically justified to enslave human beings, theologically justified by the doctrines of discovery to take the lands away from people who are not perceived to be really human because they're not Christian like us, mm -hmm. right? Like the way the way the powerful were. And uh, it's immensely painful. And then I think one part of that has to do with how we understand whether God can actually genuinely forgive or not. And I think a lot of folk in, 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 in American Christianity have, have totally misunderstood the notion of sacrifice, uh, at believing that somehow God needs a sacrifice in order to be able to forgive. So God can only forgive with, through a transaction. God doesn't have the capacity to forgive. Well, it's back to Calvin. I mean, it's yeah. just too bad that a thousand five hundred years after the Christian scriptures, which are the, the new ones in the Hebrew tradition, yeah, thousand five hundred years later, that yeah. that that theory, that religious theory of re, of he, divine human restoration came together. It's just, yeah, it's just, it's just, it's a really gross deviation. It's gruesome. It is gruesome. And and, so, and it's and it's it's been healing and exciting for me over the last four or five years to swing pretty far uh east um mm -hmm. into studying mm -hmm. eastern orthodoxy um and not it's kind of most recent also two thousand years later like we're seeing in you know patriarch kirill in russia that not the way the eastern church is just you know is still a puppet of eastern empires but the um the early roots for the first three, four, five, six, seven hundred years, um, the patristics, the early Christians in the desert, mm -hmm. um, my my favorites in the Syriac tradition, um, mm -hmm. Ephraim of Syria and Saint Isaac of Syria, mm -hmm. that they are hundreds of years after Christ, right, singing these gorgeous, gorgeous songs on on papyrus and and scrolls of of a God who is um moved to tears at the slightest suffering of like any creature or sentient being or ant and a God that is the whole universe that is pulsing with a merciful heart. Um, and that any time we try to, we try to put any kind of our punitive rage images on God, that this is projection. I mean, this is like 
1500 years before Freud and they understood human projection, <laughs> you know, because um, they like we've seen the light and this before, I don't know, this is after Plato. But yeah, we've seen the light, but we also know if we're looking the wrong way, we're casting our own big dumb shadows rather right. than looking at the light. Um, and, and so I don't know, I've, it's been encouraging for me to s- step out of what Western European Christianity has called Christianity and seeing how much of even my own faith tradition globally and culturally um, is, is, has very different roots. You know, I, I realized, you know, so in 2000 and to 2003, um, I was pastor of a congregation in Anacortes, and we held a, a fairly like thoughtful conversation about the Iraq war before it happened, right? And one of the, the really powerful learnings for me coming out of that, as uh, about 10 households left the church, and we lost about maybe 40% of our income with those households. Um, was that most people come to a lot of people come to a church because they want to have their worldview confirmed, not because they want to have it transformed, right? We progressives do it too. Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I want to go to that church because they think like us, you know, if they've got That's the rainbows right. out and I'm not going not gonna to hear any itchy Calvinist junk. And right. Yeah, I, I, we go partially because we're, we don't have to be in debate every day. You know, we, we agree. Right. right, right. And, and, and I think there, 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 it is true that like groups can probably only have a certain kind of value range and still like get anything done. I mean, I think that's, that's okay. <laughs> sure. But, sure. but part of it is that is how we end up talking with and being in relationship with people who have a truly different view, even if they aren't in the same congregation all the time. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so I, I often have to help, you know, like, like, uh, you know, progressives who are like really angry about what's happened to American Muslims in the last five or six years, mm-hmm. realize that their rage about that and the kind of purity thinking they have about that is actually not very helpful in a, in a conversation with people who are on the fence, who are persuadable. Your rage is not a strategy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right. And, and actually, uh, I've heard so many uh, people in more progressive churches say things like, well, I've never thought that terrible thing about Muslims. And then what I what I tell them is your Muslim neighbor doesn't care what you think about them. What they want to know is when their r- human rights are at stake, are you willing to stand with them? Mm-hmm. And so so much of the time, it's again, a, it, it's not a purity you know, code in terms of like washing our hands or whatever, but it's a purity code in terms of what we can say out loud and be accepted by our group and not be able to enter into a truthful debate about like very challenging, complex topics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then in conversation with more conservative folk, you know, sometimes folk just aren't listening. I mean, there's a lot of pain in, in, uh, I've listened to one guy, you know, who, um, so I was a pastor, found out what I did, was really, you know, kind of upset, um, was more of a, of a Donald Trump supporter, you know, kind of person. But at the end of a two hour conversation, what he was really feeling is that the world is complex and it's passed him by and he doesn't know if he has a place in it anymore. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. he was feeling nostalgia and he was feeling grief and loss. Yeah. And no yeah. one had ever just actually listened to him and said, you know, I can understand you feeling that way. Yeah. I don't like what you're voting for necessarily, right? <laughs> or what you're thinking about it, what you're going to do about it. But there's a lot of grief and pain out there. Yeah, I mean, it, it, absolutely. It's like, that's what I do with gang members, right? Like, I hate gangs. I hate right. gang violence. Right. But you spend enough time talking with gang members, you can see the pain they're coming from, how it, get, how it gets acted out in gang violence. And to see that, for me, that's how I hear the story you just told. is like behind some pretty violent yeah. policies and worldviews there's a really vulnerable um, experience <clears throat> behind think, that kind of armor. Yeah, and I could think of 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 no no group. Um, I mean, I think you know we've done. There's been a lot of study done on on like how dehumanization works, mm-hmm. how otherwise well intentioned people are convinced that violence against another group is okay. Yeah, and even put money behind that or allow it to happen or participate in it. Right. Well, I can think of no greater, you know, more group, more dehumanized than people who are incarcerated. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And then, I mean, then it, it, there's just cons- lower and lower concentric circles of 
you know, the worst, the worst, the most, the, the folks everyone can agree to. Be, in society, we can say, okay, the locked up folks, we can agree. And then now that there's more tension on that, people are like, okay, well, we, we can let go of the nonviolent offenders. And we can all agree we're not going to let go of the sex offenders, right? So we're, we have our own kind of gradations of our, our trash bin, our, our hell. And so, okay, nonviolent offenders, will we'll let them get a little mercy. Um, violence, maybe sex offenders, no. And so you kind of, it goes further and further down, even inside prisons. Like guys will be like, hey, I'm okay. I'm even okay with that rival gang member, but no weirdos, you know, no, no sex offenders. And so there's still, there's always a, even within the trash can, like the, the, the places where people can all agree, they are the bad ones. They are the ones we can all agree are the bad people. Wow. So I, I, for me, I really like just going, just diving right into the trash can, uh, it, right into the area where everyone in society says, well, we can agree they're no good. And then seeing, or they're all, they'll never change and seeing, delighting and seeing healing and transformation and friendship. And then, oh, oh, but gang members are the worst? Okay, let's spend time with them. And just, surprise, they can be wonderful. And that they're, they bring delight to people's lives out here as they step out and they don't need the gang armor. But sex offenders, uh, there's that one's tricky as yeah. far as like, because we're working with churches, because sure. churches have been right. uh, boundary naive covens of that yep. harm. Yes, indeed. And people in religious leadership normally aren't gang banging with a Mexican gang on the side, yep. but oftentimes people in religious leadership are uh, yep. abusing people sexually. And so it's, it's, for me, it's a little bit more complicated. It's not just trauma and judgment. There's, there's something really insidious and slippery about how that's worked within religious spaces and the leadership. So I don't want to be as glib with that, but I'd still do want to, even as I work with, with, with gang members, helping them step towards guys with sex offenses um, and not just tolerate being around them or hold their breath or wait to leave the room, but to find lines of kinship um, and to find lines of healing and forgiveness and that there's a shared journey they're on. Um, because for me, it's like, I don't know, like, you know, like when you're a little kid, like you're scared what's under the bed, but when you actually look under the bed and you turn the flashlight on and there's, there's nothing there, you yeah. can really go to bed. You can relax because like you've looked in the scariest place. Yeah. The thing you were told was there isn't there. And so for me, going into prisons and going into the high security places and finding that there are indeed no bad guys in the world yeah. makes the world a brighter place to me. Now there's, for me, it's not Pollyannish. There's unspeakable yeah. waves and layers of harm, pain and harm and trauma. But at, when you really look underneath the mask, there's no bad guys. There, so what are you left with? Just tragedy. Right. and illness everywhere yeah. that's been really exciting for me maybe that's been my impulse as a kid being told there's bad guys and there's hell i just went after the bad guys and dove into hell and been like god is here this right. is this whole world is a little less scary so so i think one of the one of the great tensions that i have felt you know within within uh, these kind of conversations and obviously like it's important to have protection for people and to keep people safe you know, in congregations and in, and in society and all that sort of thing. I mean, there, there, there is a need for protection from, from um, violent behavior, or exploitative behavior and all that. And, but I, I think one of the conversations that we, well, we get stuck in the conversation is like, there's, there's this, you know, uh, you know, prison warden God, right. Mm -hmm. Who's like, you mess up one time and boom, you know, you're done. Right. And then, on the other side, there's a kind of a progressive sort of idea that, well, there's no accountability. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't, I, I, I think that, you know, you know, Jesus was very familiar with the, you know, he used the, the image of a parent, you know, and there were several times in my life growing up where I did not behave, you know, the way I, I, you know, my dad expected me to behave. Right. And he was right about that, you know, um, and he took me to task for it. Right, but he didn't throw me out of his house. And he he took me apart in the conversation, helped me to see myself and what I had done, which wasn't all that terrible, honestly. Um, uh, but then he put me back together again mm -hmm. in that conversation. Yeah. And, and and that uh, um, 
So I think, you know, part of the conversation with a lot of American Christians who just haven't thought a whole lot about these things Mm -hmm. is to help them see that, you know, accountability doesn't mean throwing people away. Right. Yeah. Bingo. That's it. Accountability. It's it's just, it's a foolish, like seventh grade level misnomer of the word accountability. You know, it's not even a complicated theory. It's just, that's not what accountability is. Right. And that we've just equated justice, throwing people away, justice, hurting people, accountability, throwing people away. It's just, it's just silliness. That's just not even what the word means in any dictionary. And so it's, 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 I've struggled with, is it just that people are missing the words or is it just like accountability and justice were always just euphemisms, but what people truly want is punishment oftentimes. Right. What people do want is to throw people away. Sure. Because when I, you know, you look at real models of restorative justice, how accountability works, it's hard work. And that I, I'm, I would naively think that people that really believe in justice accountability, they're like, hey, let's do this really gentle workshop on restorative justice that actually makes good on accountability. They change the conversation immediately. So for me, that, that, that calls out the lie that there wasn't like, oh, you're right accountability is my value and i got sold this bad bill of goods yes tell me more about accountability because that is my value no as soon as you show them real accountability they'll change immediately what i think a lot of folks just want is punishment um and and disposal and that's hard but what i what i like can i can i dive into the restorative justice thing a little bit more please please do it yeah um i'm gonna grab this book real here This, is, this has been revelatory last year for me. Uh, it's called Until We Reckon by Danielle Sered. And she's the director of Common Justice in Brooklyn. And while there's been like an outpouring of work around the globe and scholarship around restorative justice, for those who are listening, as opposed to justice as punishment, um, you, you, what was your crime? Um, and how much does the state get to punish you? Um, restorative justice says who was hurt what harm was done, what parties are accountable and responsible to repair the harm, right? and what will ha- that repair look like and how long will it take? Um, <clears throat> and who are, the, who are the players to help decide what that is? That's right. essentially restorative justice, justice that restores instead of justice that punishes. Um, and so there's a lot of theory and kind of uh, uh, accountability circles and um, some indigenous practices that have been revived around the world, but what she's doing and how she's naming it in this book, anyone who's interested until we reckon by Danielle Sered. Um, what I really like is they've been working on this for a, a decade or two with only with violent crimes, which is great. And it's, cause normally it's just in civil suits or in juveniles or nonviolent offenses or property crimes, but she's like talking about high level violence and looking at Most folks who are, they don't even say perpetrator victims, those who are harmed and those who committed the harm. Yeah. Um, the harm is the main thing. Yeah. Because who is who harmed and who's committing the harm can change every 10 minutes, right? Or can change across generations. So it's not, a, um, those categories are not so clear, which is another thing she does. Right. But in a case of harm, people who are the harmed ones are called victims in the courts. If there's the only thing they're offered is, do you want them to be punished or nothing? They'll be like, oh yeah, punished. But the, but she says she's so surprised through their years of engaging because they, they don't have to do this restorative justice. And the victims or those who are harmed are key participants. When they're given more three or four varieties, like nothing, punishment, like throw, throw them away, lock up the key, kill them. Um, a process of them going through contrition and repentance and actively taking the lead and repairing the harm done, yeah. um, a reckoning where you just get to tell them and you can ask them any question. She says v- the percent, I don't know how that she would, I'd need to find a page, but it's really only like a small percentage of folks who really want punishment. Wow. Right? And, and, but I like that she doesn't swing the other way and say, no one wants that. She's like, no, there's some people that's all they want. But it's, it's I think she says like something like 20%. But so many people who have been harmed, if that's on the menu with other things, they want a reckoning. 
Mm-hmm. They want accountability. They want answers. They want repair. Um, they need an answer and they need to know that someone is taking responsibility, but f- less than half of people who are harmed when given options truly want punishment. Um, so this takes us right back to, to, you know, again, to Jesus, you know, because the, what I learned about a number of years ago um, uh, is the Jewish notion of teshuva, mm-hmm. which is, so when Jesus is talking about forgiveness, he's not talking about, uh, you know, okay, I forgive you. Okay. You're, you're good to go. He's talking about a process of reconciliation. Mm-hmm. So the first step when you've done, when you're a person who, who's done harm is to recognize the harm you've done. Step number two is to stop doing it. Step number three is to, you know, re- reflect on like why you did it, like what was going on with that. Um, and to have conversation with the pers- person you harmed so that um, uh, you can understand its impact on them and make restitution. Yep. And then, and then number five, and there's sometimes it's five steps, sometimes it's seven, sometimes it's 13, you know, but, um, but the last step is always public reconciliation, Mm -hmm. which is part of what the notion of sacrifice was supposed to be. So if I harm you, I invite you over to my house and at Thanksgiving and I sacrifice a turkey to you. Right. And, and that meal becomes our sort of like, I, I'm exchanging some of my life of my family with you. Yes. And so the whole idea of sacrifice to God isn't that God needs the death of the turkey, right? It's the t- it's the take the symbolism of that and recognize that yes. our reconciliation, it, 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 that God's involved in that, and that God blesses the forgiveness that happens, the the honesty, the repentance, the the restitution, and the reconciliation. Like that's what it's meant to do. Yes. Yeah. So anyway, absolutely. that's absolutely. I think that's what our communities need. And in a macro sense, I mean, I want, I want to come back to yeah th- this outline that Danielle Sered has. I don't. We probably only have a couple more minutes. Yeah, no, we're but, but okay. just to really agree with what you're saying there in a in a macro sense, the healing. It's not just about mercy for the person who's committed wrong, and right. being kind to them or embracing them or welcoming them back. Yeah. or um going easy on them but right. i really believe we are as human beings and as communities we are intertwined and so that embrace that reconciliation is for the healing of all of us mm-hmm. like to go back to what i was saying like half an hour ago about the repression you know to just looking at like the the internal to p- overlay that grid of of repression when in, when in therapy, when you're able to make contact with a part of yourself or your trauma or your childhood that you've cut off, right. when you integrate it and embrace it back into your psyche and your, your whole sense of self, you're not just mercifully being nice to that cutoff part. The rest of you is neurotic right. until it re- reintegrates with that part you've cut off. That's right. And I really believe in the macro sense, society, the non-incarcerated society, we are neurotic. So it's not until we are able to reintegrate with what we've cut off. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Totally. So we are not whole. We are not right. right. We are not psychologically well right. as, as, a, as a society until right. we can reintegrate with what we've cut off. It's not just being merciful to welcome back the cutoff part. We are well. We are very unwell until we are whole again. It, yeah. So an, a way to do that, like between groups is we are all part of one humanity. And when we don't recognize that we're not, we're, we are not well, we're not, we're not, we're, we're actually cutting off a part of ourselves. Yes. By denying the humanity of, of, of another group of another. Yeah, so let, let, let's go back to these restorative justice steps, which are really interesting. I'd be curious to hold up and a teach chart those five steps of Teshiva. Yeah. That you just outlined that here's her five. Um, she says, distinguishing accountability from punishment requires a rigorous understanding and shared definition of what accountability means. Wow. Accountability, and here's like the outline of her next five chapters, uh, requires five key elements. And this is what their whole program is based on. One, acknowledging responsibility for one's actions. Two, acknowledging the impact of one's actions on others. So I like that those are distinct of like, I did that action. And then secondly, spending time listening to the impact of how, how that hurt someone else, not just that I did it. 
Uh, three, expressing genuine remorse. Whole two chapters on that, what that means. Yep. Four, taking actions to repair the harm to the degree possible yep. and guided when feasible by the people harmed yep. or doing sorry, not saying sorry. And fifth, no longer committing similar harm. I think you in, in your schema that was the first part. This yeah, yeah, scheme. yeah. But then even in the future sense, um, not doing that anymore. She says each step has meaning and benefit for the responsible party, for the harmed party, and for the larger community society. These benefits take work to produce. Unlike punishment, accountability is not passive. That's that's something that, that she really stresses, which is beautiful too. That like punishment. She's really deft with the language, but she kind of flips it saying it's it, we're going easy on responsible parties by just locking them up. Sometimes she says she kind of like plays to the tough on crime. She says like to actually have someone step up to their shit and face it and work through it and humble themselves before their victims and drop all sense of ego and even dropping their victim narrative as they go through this. Right. That is much harder than just kind of like sitting in a cell and just being a kind of like cut off narcissist for a while in, in, in the tombs. Yeah, I think it is way harder um, and, and takes and takes way more work and and it has so much other benefit on the other side. And I, I I'm still struck by, you know, the what you said earlier about how when we explain when you explain what or you invite people into a conversation about what accountability means, about what restorative justice might entail how many folk like say, well, isn't the weather great today? Or how about those mariners or whatever, sure. you know? And, um, and I think about Jesus understanding of love. Yep. Um, love, uh, I think for Jesus was the willingness to risk ourselves, our reputation, our time, our money, right? Um, to risk ourselves for the healing of ourselves and our communities and our neighbors. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so we spend a lot of time in the Christian church talking about what Jesus was willing to risk and saying, hey, that's, that's really important, you know, right, that Jesus did that. Um, I think one of the ways that our narrative about Jesus sort of lets us off the hook, though, is that, well, Jesus took care of all that. But at the end of John, which is not my favorite gospel, you know, Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. Mm -hmm. And so there's this beautiful world, you know, right, that, that, that is envisioned in the book of Revelation, in which God's wiping the tears from everyone's eyes, mourning and crying and pain are no more. There's a river of, of life, you know, uh, that's, that runs and on both sides of the, of the river is a tree who, whose fruit is made for the healing of the nations, for all the cultures, religions, peoples of the world. And so God is, is, is trying to bring us to healing, right? And it is not a waste of time. It is actually the purpose of our life to do that healing work in the here and now. Yeah, saying Isaac of Assyria said that, like we're called, like our lives, the summit of our lives is repentance, which is like a constant work yes. of revision and healing and repair and kind of ascending into, I don't know what secular folks would say, our, mo our most evolved state uh, that he would call, you know, theosis or divinization. Right. That it's, it's, it's work. And I think of the Protestant invention as they were trying to swing the other way from all these like just terrible, gross indulgences of requirements to get into heaven. Yeah. They're like, well, you don't have to do anything, which just has just kind of kind of made us slovenly capitalist narcissists that we don't have to do anything as opposed to like a, the, the rigorous, health demands of, of a large heart and, and a healthy society. Yeah, which are not extra credit to the to the life of a disciple. They are they are actually it actually is the work of and it and it is the context in which many blessings come. So you know after I get done, I've said this sort of story many times, taught you working with a a, a minority group, minority, minority religious group in a public event, I will take them aside and say, how did I disadvantage you today? And I and I, I I don't always ask it that formally, but I assume that in some way, you know, I didn't support them as fully as I could, right? Mm -hmm. 
And there have been many times, Chris, when I have gotten home from events, you know, driving many miles, and I haven't slept that night because I realized the continued racism and religionism inside of me. Yeah. And after a while, I realized that, like, you know, and part of me is, part of me was like, well, that it sucks that I have to do that work in order, you know, this internal work in order to be able to do this external thing. And then you realize, oh no, like that is actually what Jesus means when he says, you know, take up your cross daily. It, it's what Paul means when he says, daily die and rise in Christ. Hmm. That is an extra credit. That is the thing to which you're being invited is your, yeah. your own, you know, and your collective liberation as human beings, right? And healing as human beings. Lovely. Absolutely. I, I, Terry, as I am, I have to go in just a minute here. Yeah. And I know you do as well, but I'm, 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 I've just so enjoyed our conversation and where it's taken us and some of our shared, um, kind of the, some of the creases of our story and where they align. Um, but there, there's, there's one topic I'm, I'm sad I, I didn't steer myself back towards. Um, and I'm wondering if I can just kind of like give a two minute, just throw it out there for maybe yeah. a future conversation with you and me, or if any do it. listeners are like, wanted to listen to this episode because someone was working with incarcerated spaces and this is a, an interfaith dialogue. Um, yeah. When I was first pitching one parish, one prisoner inside Twin Rivers unit in Washington state, um, <clears throat> there's, there's a large uh, class of a lot of former gang members, but different kinds of gangs. I'm used to just working with Mexican gangs here in Skagit Valley. And there was, there were, um, there were three or four Muslim gentlemen uh, yeah. in the far corner. And there was one who was clearly a leader and he, he had a lot of authority in his voice and his presence and it kind of made yeah. everyone be really quiet including me yeah and he said so i understand what you're pitching with this one parish one prisoner project i think i understand but um tell me how he's like a problem that we have is we see a lot of christian and protestant groups coming in and kind of colonizing the right. prison space through programming yeah. and and there's a long history. Uh, please don't take offense to this, sir. I see yeah. you're trying to. Yeah. You're like, he was very kind to me, but it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Offense, but there's that we have a long history of of Christians moving in a kind of a colonizing, totalizing of, of spaces, um, and and evangelizing the prison right. space. How how are you not doing that here? Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh well, so glad you asked. Well, what's your <laughs> name? Yusuf, Yusuf, and I was talking about you know we are very clear with churches. This is not to get someone to come to your church or to believe what you believe, but for us to practice what we believe and to be the church. Um, and they don't have to be, become Christian or even have Christian dialogue. And he wasn't fully impressed by that. He said, great, but, but are you working with any mosques? Yeah. Right. Like it's, it's not, that's great that your Christian churches aren't being colonizing that sense, but how are you even by not working with mosques? Yeah. How can I trust this? Um, and a new conversation began that day and we're kind of around a big circle. And I said, you know, what? I don't know many folks in mosques in my community, but I'm really enjoying the start of this conversation with you. Can we stay in touch? And if you know that world, can we start to build that? I, I know how to kind of get my tribe yep. organized. Yep. And then I don't, th I think he thought I was brushing him off, but over the next three or four years, he and I started corresponding and Yusuf and I are, are now good friends. Wow. Um, and, and Yusuf has been, reflecting with me on maybe a more Abrahamic metaphor because the Lazarus yeah. metaphor is what we use to mobilize churches. And we we're talking right. about, and, and, he, and I was like, what about, I've been speaking with some rabbis in Seattle and we're thinking about an Exodus. To, is the Exodus journey very key? So I can talk with him through prison calls. Is that central or kind of peripheral in, in, the, in the Quran and in the, the Muslim understanding? We had right. such exciting conversations about how they see the Exodus journey and how they see uh, Moses. Um, and I'm looking forward in the, in the years ahead to what the future of underground ministries and one person prisoner will look like as we, we could just say we have a non-religious version. That'd be really easy, right? Just kind of strip all the Lazarus from it, just make it relationship, love and re-entry, but how we can do the harder work together of finding new and creative different tracks or shared tracks where we're finding our hearts and our traditions animating re-entry and not getting in the way of it. Well, and I could certainly help you make some contact with some imams uh, throughout you know, Washington State Wonderful. Who, who have, I mean, some of these uh, mosques have incredible programs for 
community members who are, whether they're Muslim or not in terms of helping folk out. And I, 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 I think there, there's probably some mosques that are really, really interested in, in this kind of model uh -huh. uh, because there, there, because there, there is in the, in the Islamic tradition, you know, yeah, you, you tell people that if, if they steal, like something bad's going to happen to them, but you have to work with them 40 times before that bad thing happens. And even then, maybe you don't do that bad thing. You keep working with the person. <laughs> Sounds great. You know, it's, it's, it's really, really quite beautiful. So, um, it, so as you, as you're doing that work, you know, when the time is right or whatever, reach out to us and we'll, we'll be happy to kind of help, help you have some conversation with some really thoughtful, wonderful imams and, and other leaders, uh, in the Muslim community. So, Love uh, that. so Chris, I just really appreciate it. I want everybody to check out undergroundministries.org, uh, check out more about what they do. If you're a member of a Christian community and you want to, you know, help, help, uh, perhaps to, and make a bridge and, and an invitation, you know, please reach out uh, to them on their, on their website. Um, we want to again, thank Chris Hoke for joining us. I just so respect, you know, what you're doing and I, I continue to learn uh, from and with you brother. And I uh, just want to thank everybody for listening today. All of our past to understanding podcasts uh, can be found um, on most major podcasting services. You can find out more about past to understanding at uh, past to understanding.org. Uh, we have an extensive YouTube channel, and until we see you next time, be well, be calm, and be good to all your neighbors. <music>